Our topic is an intriguing topic. The Quran, the Great War, and the West. And while there are many, many in the world who are already expecting, anticipating that there is going to be a great war, and it will be comparable and even greater than the two great wars we've already had in the last century, the First World War and the Second World War. They have come to the conclusion that a great war is coming based on political analysis, based on analysis of military affairs, etc. But we are approaching the subject from a different perspective. We are approaching the subject from the perspective of religion. And so this is not a secular analysis. And secular scholarship, the ones who have done their PhDs in political science from Columbia University and from Harvard, uh, secular scholarship is quite uncomfortable with religion, religion intruding in what they consider to be their exclusive scholarly space. And so tonight's lecture presents more than simply a minor problem for those who are ministers of government today, advising the new prime minister of Pakistan, and uh, those who are holding the chairs of political science, etc., in different universities, and our advisors. And so we are going to speak slowly and briefly, uh, so that hopefully we might be able to, with Allah's kindness, make an impact upon the secular mind. The religious mind already has faith in its heart. But the secular mind is not. And there's another reason why we have to be brief. Today, mankind lives in what is known as the fast lane, where things are moving faster and yet faster. A whole year passes as though it was just a month. And the whole month passes as though it was just a week. And the whole week passes as though it was just a day. Are you familiar with these words? Yes, you shake your heads. This is the prophecy. This is the prophecy, not of a political science professor from Columbia University. This is the prophecy of a man named Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The fast lane in life. And in the fast lane of life, attention span becomes shorter and shorter. So if today we speak for 45 minutes, and after that, they still cannot, they cannot absorb anything beyond that. Tomorrow we'll have to speak for half an hour. And beyond that, they won't be able to absorb. Because the attention span is contracting because this is Akhirul Zaman, the end time. Secular scholarship knows nothing about the end time. But our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, told us that there is going to be Akhirul Zaman or the end time. And we know that we, were, we are living in the end time when, for example, he said, women will be dressed and yet naked. And he said, women will dress like men 
in order, of course, to assume the functional role of men in society. And I'm now stepping on some people's toes, so they're not going to be happy with me. Women will be dressed as men. Why? So that they can assume the functional role of men in society. But he went on to say that men <laughs> would be dressed like women. You're not going to see him <laughs> dressed in a rarara. <laughs> oh, sorry, no, no, no. No, when he said that men would be dressed like women, it implies, among other things, that they will abandon the functional role of men in society. Among the things he prophesied about the end time is a sequence of events which will occur. He is speaking with his companion Mu'az ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he says to him to Mu'az Umranu baytil maqdis kharabu yatrib that when Jerusalem is center stage now recognized as the capital of the state of Israel <laughs> so it's moving to center stage using the analogy of construction when Jerusalem is center stage then look to Yathrib and there are those who are not happy with the Prophet why is he using the word Yathrib? why does he use the word Medina? I don't have time for foolish people. He said, look to Yatrib. And Yatrib will be in ruins, Yani, playing absolutely no role in the world, in forlorn desolation. At that time, he said, the next event that will occur, major event, he said, Kharabu Yatrib Khurujul Madhama that the next event to occur when Jerusalem has reached center stage and Yathrib is in forlorn desolation would be the Great War. There you are. And so when we come to the subject of the Great War, we do it from a religious perspective based in our religion that our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, has prophesied the Great War. He went on to say, Khurujul Malhama Fathul Constantinia. That when the Great War takes place, the next event to occur would be the conquest of Constantinople. And then he went on to say, Fathul Constantinia, Khurujul Dajjal. That after the conquest of Constantinople, the next event which will occur would be Dajjal appearing in human form. And so now you can see that Islamic eschatology has something to offer in explaining the Great War. Because the Great War does not take place in a vacuum by accident, but rather the Great War forms part of a sequence of events which will culminate with a false messiah emerging in human form to rule the world from Jerusalem from what he would claim to be the holy state of Israel, the Khilafah state of Israel and to then declare I am the messiah. When the great war takes place, yes as we see from the Quran, that there's going to be frightful consequences for most of mankind. Oh yes. But Pakistan in particular ought to be paying attention to this subject. Because it is my opinion, and of course when I offer an opinion, I insist it should never be accepted unless and until you are convinced that I am correct because I make mistakes, oh yes. 
It is my opinion that as soon as that great war commences, an attack is going to be launched on Pakistan. If not before, at least at that time. And when the attack is launched on Pakistan, it will be to denuclearize Pakistan. And having denuclearized Pakistan to then break up Pakistan into bits and pieces so that it can never again rise as a powerful force in the world. With this introductory remarks, let us now proceed to the Great War. I turn to Surah Al Isra of the Quran, which is Surah number 17. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns, Ba'adawuzu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. He says, Wa im min qariyatin, wa im min qariyatin illa nahnu muhlikuha qabla yawmil qiyama aw mu'adzibuha azaban shadeera. Kana thalika fil kitabi mastura. And there is not a single town or city that will escape. And there is not a single town or city that will escape, but we will destroy them before the end of the world. This is not Kiyama, the end of the world. No, this is before the end of the world, before Kiyama. We'll destroy them all. And those which escape destruction will be punished with terrible punishment and this is inscribed in the book. Now those are powerful words of Surah Al-Isra. We have commented that Allah is a God of justice and so he will not destroy a town or a city which does not deserve to be destroyed. And so we now have to accept that the verse is saying that Allah will destroy every town and every city which ought to be destroyed. How many there are, we don't know. And so this is divine punishment. Which are those towns and these cities which ought to be destroyed? And the first on the list, when we go to the Qur'an, because our lecture is based on the Qur'an, is to look to see which are those towns and cities which have been destroyed by Allah. And having been destroyed, he sent a message to mankind concerning that destruction. And number one is Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, yes. When he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he left, and he left it as a sign for mankind. But if you return to this, I will return with the terrible punishment I visited on Sodom and Gomorrah. What was that punishment? The angels came and put huge, huge, huge rocks falling down from the sky. And Sodom and Gomorrah sunk to the lowest part of the earth. Up to this day, they still remain in the lowest part of the earth, and it's called by a frightful name, the Dead Sea. And Allah says, I've done this to leave a sign for you. So when the law of the land proudly and arrogantly proclaims that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. You have to be either blind or asleep not to recognize that here is a land prescribed for destruction in the Great War. I noticed that uh, <laughs> This disease is coming from one part of the world, only one part of the world. And of course, it's the West. If you do not enact legislation to support our 
our agenda, then we're going to we can take penal action against you. We can attack your, your money and your money will start falling. So every government in the world now has to come forward and step to the, to the line and enact legislation to support their agenda. It's coming from one part of the world and it's spreading to the rest of the world. And as it spreads to the rest of the world, the area of the world that Naipaul called the area of darkness, but it's a different darkness now, it's spreading. And so the area earmarked for destruction in the Great War is increasing. But destruction and war with Allah comes for other reasons as well. Let me give one more and we'll end it. All through religious history, mankind has been warned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against lending money on interest, riba. It came down in the Torah to Nabi Musa -Islam, the prohibition of riba. It came down in the, to Nabi Dawood and Nabi Suleiman in Holy Israel. It came down to Nabi Isa -Islam. It didn't come down for the first time with us. No. It came down for the last time with us. The prohibition of riba. What is the prohibition of riba? Riba is not only borrowing and lending money on interest, and I hope the government of Pakistan would have a little time to listen to my lecture. Riba is not only borrowing and lending money on interest, but Riba is also transactions based on deception, which yield a gain or a profit to which one is not justly entitled, a ripoff. And while we do not have the time to explain it now, we can do it later. The greatest ripoff that has ever occurred and is still occurring since Adam alayhi salam set foot on earth is the ripoff taking place and which has been taking place in the monetary system. They took gold and silver coins out of the market. They made it haram to use gold as money. That's in the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund. And then they replaced it with bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram. Paper money and plastic money and electronic money and cryptocurrencies and so on. And I'm not talking through my hat because I've studied my subject. That also is riba. And in the very last revelation to come down in the Quran, Allah declared war, yes, war, on riba. That if you do not give it up, take notice of a declaration of war from Allah and his messenger. And so believe you me that when the great war takes place, Allah will use the great war to wage war on the money lender. Not only did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declare war on riba, but Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam cursed. This is not obscene language. This is la'ana. He cursed. That's right. Shall I repeat it one more time? Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam cursed. That's powerful language. He cursed all four. And he said they're all equally guilty. And whoever has the curse of a prophet upon him and dies, there's no way he can escape Jahannam. None. He cursed all four and he said they're all equally guilty. The one who takes riba. 
the one who gives riba. He, took, he takes a loan from the International Monetary Fund. And now he has to repay with interest. So Muhammad wasalam, cursed him. The one who records the transaction and the two witnesses. And he said they're all equally guilty. And so now we ask, who are the money lenders of the world? And why has Allah prohibited riba? The answer is simple. That when the economy is based on riba, as the world economy today is in the grips of riba, then money will no longer circulate through the economy. And hence the rich will now remain permanently rich forever and ever and ever. And the poor will be imprisoned in permanent poverty forever and ever and ever. The government, the new government of Pakistan can offer charity to the poor. But charity will offer only temporary relief. That's all it will do. To take the poor out of destitution, you, have, you need structural change in the economy. And that structural change will come when you take on the subject of riba, both in the banking system and in the monetary system. Who are the money lenders of the world today? Of course, they are not only rich, they are permanently rich. And they grow richer and richer while the rest of the world is sinking into poverty and destitution. The money lenders of the world today are the same people who are pursuing the agenda of Sodom and Gomorrah, is the West. And so we conclude that when the Great War takes place, punishment from Allah will come most of all on the West. We now turn to Surah Al Rahman in, of the Quran, which I have spoken of in previous lectures, and I'm just touching the mountain tops with you. Nothing happens in the Quran by accident. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very, very, very economical in the use of language in the Quran. So when he chooses to repeat something, you must know there's a reason why he's doing that. For example, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّ Three times in the Quran. Three times. But he it is who has sent his messenger, Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, بِالْهُدَى with the guidance. And the deen of Al-Haq, this deen, which is named Al-Islam, has not come for the first time with this prophet. No. Don't make that mistake. This deen came with Jesus, Nabi Isa, Isa. This deen came with Moses, Nabi Musa, Isa. This deen came with Abraham, Nabi Ibrahim al-Islam, this is the last time that this deen is coming. It's the same deen. And he has come that this deen might prevail over all right. But he did not say that this ummah, which follows Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, will rule the world. No! He said, this deen will prevail over all rivals. And so those who follow Nabi Isa alayhi salam are in this deen. So when Allah repeats something in the Quran, you must know there must be a very good reason for it. And so why is Surah Al-Rahman so strange? 
Why is it that he repeats 31 times? If I have never asked myself that question, I'm still a schoolboy. Yes. I'm just scratching the Quran. I've not yet begun to study the Quran. If I've never asked myself the question, why has Allah repeated for me a year thirty one times? For be a year to Kelsivan. Allah sent down the Quran the Kaumi at the Fakarun to a people who think. Allah asks us in this surah to think at 31 times. We do not have the time today to go through the surah. But in the surah, he's sending a message concerning the great war. But you've got to learn to connect the dots. You have to use proper methodology for the study of the Quran. And when he said, Ar-Rahman, Allam al-Quran, meaning I have taught the Quran. If I teach the Quran, I also have to teach the methodology of how to study the Quran. So the methodology for study of the Quran is in the Quran. <laughs> yes. But if you use proper methodology with Surah Al-Rahman, you will see where Surah Al-Rahman is di directing us not only to the Great War, but also informing us that Allah is going to intervene in this Great War with two people to punish them. This is why it's always for me, ayi alai rabbi kuma, rabbi kuma, rabbi kuma, two of you. Who are the two? And the verse says, Ya ma'ashar al jinni wal ins. Ya ma'ashar al jinni wal ins. Allah is speaking of an alliance of two wicked people, two evil people, one who are human beings and the other who are jinn, shayateen and they are in alliance with each other. And these are the people who are going to be attacked by Allah, most of all, in the Great War. And who are these? Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins, in istata'atu man tanfudhu min aqtari samawati wal aq. There you are. There will be a people who will dazzle the world with their exploration of space and the depths of the sea and the depths of the earth. A scientific and technological revolution that takes over the skies and they control the skies. Again, it's the West. And so we realize now that the Western world and the scientific and technological revolution, which is still emerging from the West, is not taking place in a vacuum. But that there are extra terrestrial forces at work, aiding and assisting and guiding the scientific and technological revolution. Yursalu alaykum ashuazun minnar wa nuhas Allah is going to send against you a flash of fire. And it will be followed by smoke. And there will be none to help you. And we say that looks very much like nuclear war. Sanafrugu lakum thakalan. I'm going to deal with both of you. Oh, you who are laden with sin. That's Surah Al-Rahman. And so when 
In Surah Al-Isra of the Quran, Allah speaks of destroying every town and every city. And we say it will have to be towns and cities which are earmarked for destruction, which deserve to be destroyed. We conclude that the West is number one on the list. The West is number one on the list. We now turn to an amazing prophecy of Prophet Muhammad pertaining to the Great War. And whoever is the Minister of Finance in Pakistan now better pay attention to this. The Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. And the Prophet wasallam prophesied that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. A mountain of gold will come out from underneath the river. A mountain of the metal gold will come out from underneath the river. And people will fight for that gold. And 99 out of every 100 who fight for that goal will be killed. So in that war, 99% of all combatants will be killed. That is the great war. There has never been a war in all of human history in which 99% of all combatants have been killed. Never. So that is the great war. But he said, each will say, I will be the one who will survive. So when the war is fought, no one is certain of what's going to be the outcome. But the believers must not touch that goal. We can either accept this as muhkam, meaning it has to be understood literally, in which case we will wait for a mountain of the metal to come out from underneath the river. And only when that mountain of the metal gold comes out of the river, only then will the Great Wall take place. There will be no malhama. No malhama. Until the mountain of metal comes out from underneath the river. So until then we can go home and eat our biryani and go to sleep. But there's another way, <laughs> and that is to understand this as mutashabiha. That it has to be subjected to ta'wil, to be interpreted. And we offered an interpretation of this several years ago. Because Allah was kind to bless us with study of international economics and international monetary economics in two universities. Because of that knowledge that Allah kindly blessed me with, I was able to interpret that in 1974, the prophecy was fulfilled when a, an ocean of oil underneath the river began to function as a mountain of gold when the petrodollar was born, when Saudi Arabia agreed that they will sell their oil for only U.S. dollars, nothing else. You cannot buy oil other than U.S. dollars. So the U.S. dollar became a petrodollar. And an ocean of oil underneath the river began to function, sorry, as a mountain of gold. This is my interpretation. Since I gave this interpretation several years ago, no one has challenged it so far. No. But still we must say Allah knows best because only Allah can confirm that an interpretation is correct. So when will the Great War take place? Answer, when they begin to fight for the mountain of gold, which is the petrodollar monetary system. Has the challenge to the petrodollar monetary system has started as yet? Of course. <laughs> we were eating our biryani and going to sleep. They started. Russia led the way with BRICS. Russia, China, India, South Africa, and Brazil. BRICS. To offer an alternative, another monetary system, an alternative to the petrodollar monetary system. And they are making headway. Yes. China, for example, has now offered to Saudi Arabia 
And Saudi Arabia has to be careful because China is the biggest customer now for Saudi oil. That we will pay for your oil with Chinese yuan. And when we pay with the yuan, we'll offer to redeem the yuan for gold at the market rate. So China is not in conflict with the international monetary system, which has banned the use of gold as money. But China is bypassing the petrol law. This is a, an indication that the, the, the system is now heating up for a challenge to the mountain of gold, and eventually it could lead to the collapse of the US dollar. When there is the possibility of collapse of the US dollar, of course, that could lead to the Great War. And when the Great War takes place, the 99 out of every 100 will be killed. We now turn to an analysis of what kind of war will it be. It has to be a war with weapons of mass destruction. It cannot be conventional warfare. Only a war fought with weapons of mass destruction, like nuclear weapons and thermonuclear weapons and other weapons we don't know of, can achieve the result of 99% of all combatants being killed. Why do they need such a war? Why do they need the Melhama? This is not within the scope of our lecture, but the lecture cannot be complete unless we touch on it. It is only Islamic eschatology, let me repeat one more time, not political science, not economics, not monetary economics, not the historian who can fully explain the phenomenon of a great war coming, only eschatology. And we are able to offer an explanation based on a verse of the Quran in Surah Al-Mursalat, which is the last surah I'll be quoting before I end, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns, he says, in taliku ila zillin zi salasi shu'ab, proceed to a shadow which has come over the world. And that shadow will have three parts, will manifest itself in three stages. In order for there to be a shadow, it has to be the shadow of something. So what is the reality behind this shadow, which will appear in three parts? The Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam that when the Dajjal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. This is a hadith of Sahih Muslim. And you will find an analysis of this hadith both in my book Surah al kaf and the Modern Age and my book Jerusalem and the Quran. He will live on earth for 40 days. Yawmun kasana, one day which will be like a year. Yawmun ka shahr one day which would be like a month, yawmun ka jum'ah one day which would be like a week, wa sa'iru ayyamihi ka ayyamikum. And all his days, meaning all the rest of his days, like our days. So Dajjal, when he enters into this world, when he's released from his chains, will be in a shadow. He will cast a shadow on the world. You will not be able to see him. You'd only see the shadow. And the shadow will have three parts before the shadow ends. And the Jah will appear himself in person after the conquest of Constantinople. The shadow, the shadow goes. In Teliku ila zillin zi salasi shu'ab. I am offering an interpretation of the Quran. I have the right to do so. But I must always say, Allah knows best. Because only He can confirm that this is the correct interpretation. 
And so we say the shadow are the three parts of the mission of Dajjal before he appears in human form. And in the first stage, we said, in that first, located within that first stage, in his mission, who he wants to rule the world from Jerusalem, he creates a ruling state in the first stage, and that's Britain. That's Britain. And so we are able to explain the phenomenon of Pax Britannica because of our eschatology. We ask the political scientists, can you explain it? No, he cannot. The whole of Columbia University cannot explain it. We say this is the Jal first stage. And then in the second stage, we said it's Pax Americana, where one ruling state is replaced by another ruling state. The United States has this manifest destiny <laughs> of ruling the world. And then the second ruling state is replaced with a third one. And we say that's Jerusalem, that's Israel, and that's Pax Judaica. But then we notice that Pax, Ameri Pax Jude Britannica could not come into being without great wars. Great wars of imperialism, conquest. The East India Company taking a foothold until eventually Britain ruled over India. And then we notice that the transition from Pax Britannica to Pax America needed two great wars, the First World War and the Second World War. And so we conclude now that the transition from Pax Americana to Pax Judaica cannot take place without a great war. And so our conclusion, we conclude that the great war is going to take place in order to effect the transition from a Pax Americana to a Pax Judaica. And therefore we locate the Great War in a messianic, messianic, messianic interpretation of the movement of history, a messianic <coughs> interpretation of the movement. Of, this is difficult language. Messianic from the word Messiah, meaning the Messiah, the false Messiah wants to rule the world from Jerusalem. We want to end at this point because I've given you the structure of the subject. But I would like to advise you that if you want to understand the reality of the world today, you've got to study the Quran. If you want to take Pakistan out of miserable poverty and destitution, you have to understand you can't do it simply with charity. That's only temporary relief. You need structural change. And you cannot bring about structural change in Pakistan until you restore a free and a fair market to Pakistan. And if you restore a free and a fair market to Pakistan, you'll know that it is a free and fair market when Allah can now intervene and cause wealth to circulate through the economy. So the poor can become rich and the rich can become poor. But they don't teach that at university. Not even with your PhDs. And, excuse me, I'm sorry to say this. It's also not taught in the Darul Ulum. I'm sorry to say this. But I'm warning you from Birmingham that you cannot succeed without the Quran. We, may, we pray that Allah might bless all those who now turn to the Quran and study it so that the Qur'an might explain the great war which is coming. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ إِنْتَ السَّمِيرُ الْعَلِيمُ وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا يَا مُولَانَا إِنَّكَ إِنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ